calling for the Green County Sheriff's. Um, I found some bones along the side of the road. And with that 911 call, the disappearance of Cheryl Coker takes a whole different turn. Uh, you guys might remember from Brain Scratch Searchlight where we covered this case. Um, this is one where it looked like from the outset it had to do with some type of domestic violence issue. Um, and then, of course, we have law enforcement later naming a suspect. Now that these cases are becoming brain scratch cases, uh, we're gonna try to do things a little different. Instead of me just telling you there's a link down below, we're actually going to look back on that episode of Searchlight. Uh, there was actually two of them. The first one came out on November 21st, 2018. And then we did a follow-up segment on February 20th of 2019. Uh, this isn't the whole episode, so I will still have the links down below, but I think it's important to get all the details of this case out. Um, with Cheryl's case, we still don't have an arrest. We still need tips called in. Of course, we have that info in the description box below. But let's take a look back, and then I'll give you the current news on what's going on with this. Cheryl was last seen on October 2nd, 2018 in Riverside, Ohio. She dropped her youngest daughter off at school around 7.30 a.m., and law enforcement believes she may have returned home after. Cheryl's vehicle was found on October 3rd, 2018, around 8 p.m. in the parking lot of Clancy's Tavern, about half a mile from her house. Her driver's license, purse, credit cards, and cell phone were inside the car. One thing I'm not sure of that I'm wondering is were her keys also inside the car, but unfortunately I can't find any details about that. Cheryl works as a crash technician and her employer, KLD Associates, is flexible about letting her work from home. So it wouldn't be unusual for her to go home instead of to work. That day, however, nobody was able to contact Cheryl. She did not show up for work at the office or do any work from home. Very strange circumstances. I, I got to tell you guys, I'm also just a little bit bothered that the car uh, was found a little bit more than half a mile from her house, but just not a very large distance. And if someone that does live in the home is responsible for this, taking the car that far away would ensure that they're able to walk back home and be there within about 10 minutes. If they don't walk, but if they run, uh, they could get there a lot faster. So um, just in terms of that, I'm already really bothered because it seems like a very small window uh, where someone could drop off the car, be back at home. And you're talking about a matter of minutes, even if an investigator is putting a timeline together, um, you know, who really needs an alibi for five minutes? They just, they don't run that tight. So uh, we'll see. Coker's daughter, Marissa, located her mother's car and belongings the day after she was last seen. Marissa Coker said she used the Find My iPhone app to locate her mother's cell phone. And that's when she found the car in a parking lot near Clancy's Tavern on Burkhart Road. Marissa Coker said she feels that discovery alone is disturbing since her mother didn't frequent any of the businesses on the side of the strip mall where her car was found. Coker is a mother of two and had filed for divorce 11 days before her disappearance. Now, I was able to find the record of the court dockets that were being filed for the divorce. It does look to me that she was also filing for custody, probably of the youngest daughter. I think she might have also been filing for child support. I'm not a legal expert, but just kind of based on what I'm seeing there. Um, so there was a lot going on in this household at the time that she disappeared. The parking lot where her vehicle was found has a few different surveillance cameras that are picking up her vehicle moving into the parking lot. Uh, let's go ahead and watch this together. Unfortunately, there is no footage of anyone getting out of the vehicle. Uh, it's described that one of the cameras that's picking up this footage is motion activated and the vehicle's kind of a bit far away from it. The other one is supposedly running on a continuous loop, but there might be some reasons why it doesn't pick up anyone uh, based on the direction that they're walking out. But here you can see in the circle, the vehicle is pulling in, coming across kind of towards the back of the parking lot, but there's even more spaces beyond where it comes in. And that's it for the first camera. Now the second camera picks it up and we see it 
coming down a bit closer to the businesses. The businesses are where these cameras are shooting from uh, and parking itself kind of in the edge of where the parking spaces are full. And I'm wondering if someone was doing that because they were looking to um, hide their vehicle. This is a large parking lot. We can actually jump to a picture of the parking lot here as well. Uh, so you can see this is a really large parking lot. And about over here is where this vehicle comes in and winds up parking. So it would seem to me that they were trying to maybe not hide it very well, but they certainly didn't want it sticking out. Like if they would have parked it back up here somewhere where it was kind of on its own, it might've been really easy for a police cruiser driving by that might've had an APB on it or something um, to be able to see it. So parked furthest away from the road, uh, right at the edge of the natural parking traffic that was happening there. What else is interesting about this footage is it does show that the vehicle was traveling north on Spinning Road before turning into the parking lot. Her home, which is about a half mile away, is down on a street called Christie Avenue that's right down over here. So assuming the most direct path, if you were going to drive to that shopping center, you would probably be coming north on Spinning Road and then turning into it. So uh, once again, I don't know, this could support both, both thoughts with this case. This could support the thought that she did this and maybe she wasn't taking a bus. Maybe she met up with someone that was driving her away and they met up on Burkhart or something along those lines. Um, if you're of the mind that there might be some foul play scenario involved here that took place at her house, once again, it's kind of supporting that just in terms of the direction that the vehicle is going. But a uh, search warrant suggests kidnapping. This is over at whio.com. Riverside police believed probable cause for felony kidnapping existed in the case of Cheryl Coker, the missing Riverside mom, according to an October 11th search warrant. Additionally, Riverside Police confirmed Wednesday that a second piece of video surfaced in the case and is being considered evidence in Coker's disappearance, but officials would not discuss what the video showed or release a copy to reporters. That is really intriguing um, because we know, thankfully, we have a time code of when the vehicle gets dropped there. I'd be very surprised if the investigators did not go to all the other local businesses in all directions from where that vehicle was dropped and ask them for footage as well. Uh, there's a very good chance that they have footage of the person that dropped off that vehicle. And considering how these search warrants are being written, um, kind of assuming that there's a kidnapping going on here, I have a feeling that footage does not include her probably includes a person of interest that they're looking into. But um, that's just my two cents theorizing on what they can have in terms of video footage. Investigators sought a lengthy list of items from the Coker residence, the warrant shows, including furniture covers, body fluids, computers, cell phones, weapons, tools, and other items used to conceal or dispose of a body, and any and all materials electrical stimuli, chemicals, topicals, indigestible or inhalants that could render a human unresponsive or unconscious. What detectives found, if anything, and whether police still thought probable cause for kidnapping exists is unclear. But you can see, based on what they wrote that search warrant for and what they were looking for, they are certainly... Um, they're certainly looking for something bad to have happened specifically in that house. The search warrant affidavit references a text message exchange between Coker and her co-workers about her pending divorce from husband, William Coker. Quote, I will be in tomorrow if I'm not dead, a portion of the text message to her co-workers from September 24th read, according to the affidavit, the text message came less than a week before her disappearance. The messages referenced Cheryl Coker's husband reportedly texting her after being served with divorce papers saying, thanks for putting the nail in my coffin. Uh, I've seen some longer versions of the text exchanges, and it seems like he is concerned about where he works. I really don't want to publicly put that information out, but uh, it seems like there's an affair that's possibly going on that is somehow going to affect him at the place he works at. 
So I'm kind of assuming it might be an affair that is going on with someone that is also in that business or something inappropriate. Like he was in a management position and he was, you know, having an affair with someone that was directly reporting to him or something along those lines. Um, so yeah, the, the longer text message exchange so certainly points to him being worried about uh, him essentially being lowered in position. So what else was looked for with these search warrants? Uh, court records show police have searched the following places as part of their investigation. They had two search warrants issued for a Toyota Tacoma, another two warrants for a Toyota Highlander. I'm assuming one of those vehicles, I think the Highlander, if I recall correctly, is Cheryl's. I think the Tacoma would more than likely be Williams. A search warrant of husband William Coker's cell phone, so they are going to check his phone specifically, court orders to search the bank records of both Cheryl and William, court order to search records held by William Coker's place of employment. Um, interesting. And once again, might point to the situation I was talking about where maybe there was some type of relationship that was happening there. I would assume they would probably be asking for electronic communication on the employee devices if there was some type of uh, affair that was happening in that work environment. So I think that's probably what that court order would be for. Two court orders for cell phone records for two separate phone numbers. We don't know what the phone numbers are. Could they possibly be burner phones that were being used by someone um, to have some type of you know, relationship outside of letting their partner know. And that doesn't only say William, could also be Cheryl in, in that case as well. Or could there be could those be phone records for other people that are involved with one or both of these uh, these married people? And a search warrant of the Coker residence on Christie Avenue. After weeks of attempting to contact Cheryl's husband, William, with no luck, News Center 7's James Brown caught up with him at work. William said that he loves his wife very much and that he didn't have anything to do with his wife's disappearance. Quote, I wish I knew what happened. I have theories, but I don't want to get into those because it would hurt my daughter. When asked if William thought Cheryl was still alive, he said, I sure hope so. I loved her. And then in February of 2019, some more developments happened. So over here at WHIO.com, Cheryl Coker case, now homicide investigation, husband named suspect. Uh, yeah, so let me tell you guys, I actually took notes while the conference was going on so I could tell you specifically what I was hearing and let's get into it. So first of all, they're releasing more footage. They have additional footage from the Kroger's market. Um, I don't know if it was from Kroger's in particular, it was a, a shopping center where the vehicle was dropped off. That footage does include someone leaving the vehicle. They described it as a white Caucasian male wearing pretty much all black and pulling a hood up over his head. Detectives thought this was strange um, because apparently it was pretty warm at this time of year and why is he kind of wearing so many layers in terms of, terms of clothing and keeping his hood up. Uh, on top of that, there is footage from Spinning Hills Middle School, once again showing this same person walking through. Uh, they released a 911 call, which has a witness that actually saw this man walking through the neighborhood, thought he was strange, um, called it in, because he's wondering why is this guy wearing all black walking through the neighborhood? A second person also called in. One of those witnesses talked about the fact that they drove around the block to check this guy out again. And when they passed him, he literally covered his face with both hands. So very suspicious behavior. And then another piece of footage from inside the Kroger's later that night when the suspect, Cheryl's husband, actually showed up and did some shopping on the day that his wife went missing. And isn't it kind of interesting? He goes shopping back at Kroger's. Um, I don't believe her vehicle was actually found at that time. So did he not kind of drive through the parking lot, maybe notice her vehicle out there? I don't know. Maybe it could have happened. Maybe it couldn't have happened. But 
uh, investigators are being very clear. They do believe that he is involved with this case now, and they're releasing all these new pieces of information because they're looking for more tips. They're trying to get more support from the public in terms of putting this together. We've already got a couple witnesses and the locations of those witnesses that kind of support this is a person that was walking from that shopping center back towards the direction of Cheryl's home, even all the way up to Cheryl's backyard. And who would be doing that? It's very likely it could be her husband, who, by the way, said that he was home through this whole period of time where all this was going on. Uh, they noticed that it looks like he has a wound above his left elbow. Is that going to come into play if this thing ever heads into a courtroom? Uh, possibly. William Coker is the suspect, and this is a homicide investigation. They were very, very clear about that. Uh, the reporter even asked, is he the only suspect? Is there you know, possibility of other people being looked into at this time? They were extremely clear, no, William is our one and only suspect in this case. It's almost frustrating at times, um, especially having hindsight, which yes, hindsight is 2020. But when we look back at the original information that we were putting out there, it just looked right on the face of it like this is a domestic violence type situation. And how do we go for this period of time without there being an arrest? And honestly, even right now, we still don't have an arrest in this case. And I'm kind of wondering why, uh, if nothing else from that, we can assume that police might need more information. And quite honestly, even if there was an arrest in this case, I'm, I'd still be asking for the same thing. We're going to look at another case before today's episode is over where they do have an arrest. And I'm still asking for help because we need to make sure that these convictions go through, that justice is actually found for both of the women that we're talking about today. Um, but let's get the latest in terms of the news on Cheryl's case. So over at WDTN.com, February 19th, 2020, uh, Riverside police say they are still actively investigating. Uh, Wednesday, the department released a statement on the status of the investigation saying they are committed to locating Mrs. Coker and bringing the suspect responsible for her disappearance to justice. Wednesday also marked one year exactly since police announced Coker's husband, William or Bill Coker, as the only suspect in her disappearance, but he has never been charged and no arrests have yet been made. In the last year and a half, volunteers, police cadets, and Texas EquiSearch have conducted around a dozen searches for Coker as her family and friends remain hopeful for justice. So, of course, this is an article from before the discovery. This is from back in February. Let's roll time forward a little bit more, and this is April 27th of 2020. Ohio. The Greene County Sheriff said in a news conference Monday, the skeletal remains found in Waynesville Jamestown Road in Caesar Creek Township have been identified as Cheryl Coker. Saturday night, authorities say a mushroom hunter found the remains in a remote area about a 15 minute drive from Coker's home in Riverside. Um, I got to tell you guys, I'm kind of surprised at how often I hear that it's a mushroom hunter. I've seen several other cases in the past over these, you know, four or five years that I've been doing cases like this where it's a similar person. It's someone hunting mushrooms. Sometimes it's someone walking a dog. Someone, sometimes it's out, someone just out for a hike. But um, thankfully, even despite the fact that many of us have stay at home orders right now, there's still people that are getting out there. They're getting out there for exercise. Uh, and we have a man that fortunately was looking in the right area and now has brought some answers in this case. We've never given up on this case, said Chief Frank Robinson with Riverside Police. We never wavered from what we needed to do to follow all the evidence we've collected and all the evidence anyone has collected for us. And I just want to say, thank you to all the organizations, all the ones who went out and searched, and all the other agencies who went out and picked up evidence. I can't thank enough Greene County for all their efforts this week and over the weekend. One of the leaders in the aggressive search effort for Coker, this, this guy is becoming a hero in my book. I feel like I'm talking about him every week. David Rader with Texas EquiSearch says he never gave up hope that Coker would be found. It's devastating, but yet when I talk to the family, it's a little bit of peace of mind right now because they at least know where Cheryl is, he says. And we talked about that earlier this week on Searchlight with the Eric Proct case. There's just, 
um, at least there's that one answer. And yes, maybe it opens up a whole bunch of other questions, but for the families, that is an important answer to have, and he's echoing that here as well. Raider and his team helped organize 14 searches for Coker as recently as two weeks ago. He says they covered a lot of ground, but they never looked in the area along Waynesville, Jamestown Road. From what I understand, this was probably anywhere from 17 to 20 miles from her residence, he said. Now that we have the greatest piece of the puzzle that we were looking for, now they can start the process of putting together how and who Raider said. And that's kind of interesting in this case because we already have a suspect in this case. So in terms of who, they know what direction to look in. Um, there's a good chance we even have footage of this guy, but unfortunately the camera's just too far away for that to be a, a tool for a positive identification. Um, to his point about the distance on here, 17 to 20 miles, I just wanna call out Gray Hughes, uh, who is amazing with maps and locations. Uh, he has a video, I'm gonna have a link to it in the description box below, where he finds the exact location where the body was found. It's a little bit different than media has been saying, um, but Google Earth is amazing at in terms of getting you on the ground level, and I really think you should check out Gray's video, so I'll have a link to that down below. Over at Dayton Daily News, there is no evidence that her body had been buried, investigators said. And uh, we've seen some information from the 911 call where it seems like um, he, he found her body just kind of laying out there. So it doesn't seem like it was buried. We're going to get some more detail uh, in an article coming up here. A person who found bones off the road in Greene County told a 911 dispatcher that it appeared the bones had clothing on at some point. I found some bones along the side of the road, and it was actually wearing clothes, I think, the man said. The man said that the remains appeared to be wearing pants and a sweatshirt. The bones are just bones, but there is clothing with them, he says. I just touched the bottom part with a stick to see if they were actually wearing, and it appears that they've either stuck to or whatever the bones are was wearing the pants. Um... So it really does sound like she might have just been taken to that area after um, she was murdered and then just literally dropped in that bushes, uh, that cluster of trees and bushes. Um, terrible, terrible to think about. But hopefully that also means that there's some evidence out there that can really help investigators close these final hoops. And man, I, I was hoping that today just, I've been working on this case all week. I was hoping I would see the news update today that they finally made an arrest in this case. And we just are not quite seeing it yet. Uh, there are some tests that are going on. We're going to touch on that too. The clothing was taken as evidence. And there was also some other evidence on the scene that provided coroner's investigators with a presumptive identification prior to that identification being confirmed Monday. Um, I'm not exactly sure what items could have been with her because I think most of her items were actually left uh, in the vehicle, but somehow there was something that was with that body that clued them in on the fact that this was Cheryl pretty much immediately. And it's just so weird how things like this sometimes happen in this universe, but Coker was, uh, she literally had her birthday on Friday night and she was found on Saturday. Um, it's just the, the synergies that happen around these cases sometimes are, are kind of mind blowing. Over at Dayton247now.com, uh, Coker's best friend of over 20 years, Shelly Apollons, couldn't believe the news. Somebody just dumped her in a field and like she was a nobody and she didn't matter. I wholeheartedly believe Bill did it, she said. I don't see the benefit from somebody else doing this to her besides him. It's a good point. Unfortunately, we don't always understand the motives in some of these cases. Sometimes they're driven by things that are extremely personal to the person that's committing them, and they might not even be all that lined up with reality. Um, but she's making a very good point, and he's been a suspect for over a year at this point. So um, I, I think there's probably a good chance that she's very, very right about that assumption. As for what's next in this investigation, Montgomery County Prosecutor Matt Heck said he has not yet been sent charges from Riverside PD. 
Montgomery County and Greene County Coroner's Office are working in conjunction. Montgomery County is handling Coker's autopsy, and once that's completed, Greene County will announce the final cause of death. This may take up to several weeks. So I'm wondering if they're waiting for that. I just I don't know why they couldn't arrest him on suspicion of murder at this point. Um, but it seems like they might be waiting for the autopsy to be complete. And we don't know. I mean, we, we know the status of her remains. We're talking skeletal remains. So being able to identify what exactly happened to her is probably going to be a bit of a challenge. Maybe that clothing might help draw some conclusions, especially if there's some type of damage to the clothing that coincides with a wound that they can find on the bones in some way. Um, so I'm, I'm very curious to see what happens with this analysis. Um, but... I hope that they have enough of a case that they don't actually need very strong analysis outside of this looks like a pretty obvious homicide. Um, but it's tough to know because obviously the investigators are playing a lot of cards very, very close to their vest. So for Cheryl, we're going to keep an eye out. Um, but once again, I have contact information in, in the description box below. Obviously, this case is not done. There's more information that's needed. And if someone out there has that information, I really hope they see this video. And if you're that person, please, now's the time. Get that information in so that they can add it to this case. Maybe get this arrest rolling and start some prosecution around all this. Now, where we have Cheryl's body being discovered and we have no arrest yet to happen. In the case of Ella Dybolt Jackson, we have an arrest that has happened, but we don't know where Ella is. It's, it's very, very strange. Um, and once again, we're looking at what is most likely a domestic violence situation. So let's take a look back at the searchlight for Ella Dybolt Jackson, which was in November of 2019. Everything of hers is at the house. She wouldn't leave her kid behind. She wouldn't leave my little brother behind like that. Who goes away without their phone and without their child and without their car and, and doesn't contact uh, the people that they're in contact with on a daily basis. That was the eldest son and ex-husband of missing person, Ella Dybolt Jackson. English, Russian, and Russian to English, translator and editor. Translation for clients in tech, medical, pharmaceutical, legal, finance, marketing. Uh, this is someone that was originally born in Russia. I believe she was raised in the Ukraine and then came over to the U.S., uh, she graduated from a university in Kentucky. I can't remember which one off the top of my head. Uh, and she's had two marriages. Both of them have been to professors of universities in Kentucky as well. Ella Dybolt Jackson, also known as Ella Hans, that's actually uh, her name from her previous marriage, was last seen at her home on October 20th. Uh, of course, I'm recording this on the 26th, uh, so we're talking a month and a week at this point that she's been missing. Certainly um, a, a reason to be concerned with that. The 48-year-old's phone, dog, car were all left behind. So was her five-year-old son who's being cared for by her husband. Now there is a story that we are getting from the husband, which is that she asked him to take the five-year-old son and to uh, give her some time at home alone. And basically when they came home, she was gone and all these items are being left behind. Uh, how she left without the car is certainly a question. Uh, not impossible. They're not in an area that's kind of out in the middle of nowhere. I mean, there is public transportation options or there could be someone that's helping her along the way in terms of um, taking her to another location. Um, unfortunately, there is no NamUs profile that is available for her case yet. It, it's strange. I'm, I'm also just going to be completely honest with you guys. I think it's really strange that we have her ex-husband essentially leading the media front. Um, he's the one that appears in most of the articles speaking about her. Uh, her son also certainly doing some work in that regard, but her current husband, um, not a whole lot. I'm only finding, I think, one reference to something that he said, and I'm seeing a couple of articles that say that they've reached out to him, and uh, basically he's not responding to those organizations. 
organizations. So well, the area she goes missing from, we know it's her home. It is on Westwood Drive in Richmond, Kentucky. You can see that is um, kind of a, a bit of a short street. It doesn't go all the way through. It kind of hits a hoop. There's another street back here and then another street name. So pretty tight area. Uh, when we're looking at the area kind of overall, We've got a freeway kind of bordering over on one side or a highway. Um, we've got a lot of homes around here and some businesses to the south. Not a ton of open area, a little bit of open area out here. Um, but there's just not a lot of places. I mean, if we are looking at a worst case scenario, um, I don't know that she would be very close to her actual home. Also looking for water sources in this area. We do have a couple of ponds. We've got a couple of lakes that are nearby as well. Um, I have no idea if there's searches that have been done in those areas in particular. Hans went on to say Jackson would never abandon her five-year-old son or disabled dog who requires daily medicine. Jackson's husband, EKU English professor Glenn D. Jackson, told Lex18, Jackson asked him and their young son to leave the house last weekend for an extended period of time. He believes she left on her own. Jackson's older son, Philip, disagrees. That's literally the only info that I've seen that comes directly from her current husband, uh, Glenn Jackson. And by the way, I did find a picture of him here. Um, there is more information out there, but you know, I'm, I'm not trying to dox the guy. He's got his, you know, his info's all over the place because he's a professor. But we have her missing, and we have a very weak story that's been put out publicly about the conditions of her disappearance. We've got no real timeline on this day built up. We've got no dialogue or discussion going on about reasons why she might disappear. Uh, is there another man involved? Was she unhappy in her marriage for some reason? Um, were they talking about separating or something along those lines? Of, of course, we've got no insight into any of that because the current husband isn't talking. And who knows if the ex-husband would know about that? Who knows if her eldest son would even know about that? The only other very small thing that I could find as I was looking into this case is a record of what looks like a real estate transaction, a piece of land that was sold, I believe in August, a couple months before this, and looks like it was sold for a pretty good amount of money, a couple hundred thousand dollars that uh, it looks like went to the previous owners, which I believe was her, her current husband, and it looks like a family member of her current husband. Could that be related to this case? I have no idea. It's the only other thing that I could find that basically their names showed up on. And I literally literally looked through every result uh, in Google that came up. Anything that hit on her name, I was, I was looking at it. Um, but all of a sudden, you have a couple hundred thousand dollars rolling around. Does that change the dynamic? What if there was trouble in the relationship? Would all of a sudden he be concerned that she's going to take a chunk of that money as she heads out? Um, Possibly there's something to that. I don't know. On Tuesday, investigators entered into the missing woman's home on Westwood Drive, where her and her husband live. Search canines could also be seen walking the property. Richmond Assistant Police Chief Rodney Richardson says the search is part of the department's protocol when investigating any missing person. Richardson says the search includes looking for any clues and speaking with neighbors. Our ultimate goal is to find Mrs. Jackson and find her safely. If something happened to her, we want to know what happened to her, said Richardson. Richardson says no substantial evidence was found or can be released. Kind of a strange statement, and I'm wondering if that was just written clunky in the article. So I was actually surprised by an email uh, when it came to this case. The first person to reach out to me was Ella's ex-husband. Um, who reached out to me very soon after I put out that original episode. And, uh, you know, he, he was very appreciative for the fact that we were trying to raise exposure to this case and trying to help in this way. Uh, and literally, even before, you know, Christy keeps track of all these cases and sets up news alerts and then lets me know about updates that have happened. Before I could even get the update from Christy, uh, Jason was in contact with me to, to let me know about these developments. Uh, the first thing I want to start with is... At the time of the recording there, Ella did not have a NamUs profile, and now she does. Um, so that did happen. 
And I don't think we really need to go over it all again, but for the circumstances of the disappearance, they're kind of telling the same story that we've been questioning right from the start. According to her husband, she told him to take their son and dog for a walk at a local dog park, Million Park. Uh, he states he was at the park for a few hours, and when he came home, she was gone. She left her vehicle, her phone, and did not appear to pack any clothing or makeup. Well, on April 24th, we have the Richmond, Kentucky Police Department putting out this notice. There has been an arrest, Glenn D. Jackson, for suspicion of murder, domestic violence, and tampering with physical evidence. Uh, what else can we learn about this? Let's jump through some articles. Kentucky.com. Richmond police have charged the husband of Ella Dybolt Jackson, a Richmond woman who has been missing since last fall, with her murder. Glenn Jackson, 39, was arrested Friday. Over at WYMT.com, there's a picture of the headshot as they're taking him in and processing him. Police have continued to search for her. Uh, that was the first thing that I asked Jason. I was like, amazing. Do we know where she is? And unfortunately, we still don't know where she is. Um, I'm curious. It, it makes me sick to think about this, but I'm curious if Glenn is going to try to use that as some type of bargaining chip in the prosecution phase. Um, I just, I really wish people would do the right thing in these situations and just let her friends and family bring her back. Um, but I, I don't know if, if he's that type of guy. It doesn't seem like it. Uh, police discovered that only a few days before her disappearance, she met with a domestic violence advocate. Additionally, a search of their home and vehicles led to the discovery of a significant amount of blood in the trunk of Mr. Jackson's vehicle, which was proven to belong to his missing wife. Now, that might play a big factor in terms of what's going on with being able to make this arrest so far. I know in some cases when they find a significant amount of blood, they can make a determination that the amount of blood in there would have been from a fatal wound, that there's just too much blood that escaped from that person's body. There's no way that that person's still alive unless they received medical attention. If that's what they're talking about in this case, that might make sense why they were able to go ahead and get this arrest. This is, we've been talking about this for the past few weeks on the channel too. This is essentially a no body homicide case at this point, but they might have a very big factor when it comes to the blood that they found in the trunk that might help the prosecution. Uh, police also found several recordings Mrs. Jackson made of arguments between her and her husband. Um, that's one of those things where I'm thankful that they have it, but I'm also wondering about the risk factor in terms of trying to do that. I mean, can you imagine if this is a very violent house, which apparently it is to the point where he ends her life. But if he had found out that she was making those recordings or something like that, I mean, that could have um, been an escalation point. If she was making plans to leave and it kind of sounds like it, she's talking to a domestic violence advocate only days before we know, especially from the experts that we've had on the channel uh, over the past few months at this point, we know that's the most dangerous time. We know that that's when violence um, can really escalate and turn into something very, very bad. So I'm curious if if any of those things are, are factors in this case. And it just really, I, I want to remind everyone, I know these situations are terrible. I know they're extremely hard to get out of. You have to put a, a team together. You have to do some things kind of in secret to make all of this work. Uh, I know it's not easy. I've put together a new page over at brainscratchers.com. Um, it's got the episode of Brain Scratch with some several uh, domestic violence advocates that I've spoken to about information that can help with that. Um, it's also got links to additional information. It seems like she's trying to take the steps and it's just such, it, I, I don't want to dissuade people from doing it. You have to take these steps to, to get your life back. Um, but in some cases, maybe it's like ripping off that band aid. Like, you know, the faster you can get these things done and the faster you can get out of that situation, the better. The thing is, I know there's no one piece of advice that's going to work for every single case here. These are extremely complicated situations. It's almost like you have to find the right mix that works for your particular situation. But there's a lot of information out there. I hope the new page over at brainscratchers.com will help 
uh, get people pointed in the right direction for even finding better information beyond that. So I'll have a link to that in the description box down below as well. Mrs. Jackson was also said to have told several individuals that she was afraid of him and that if anything ever happened to her, her husband would be responsible. It's just absolutely terrible. It, it also breaks my heart just thinking about what relationships, what good marriages are, and that that's something that two people decide to work towards and to wind up in this type of situation. And unfortunately, we're going to hear this isn't the first time that she's been in a marriage like this. It's truly, truly heartbreaking. Over at CourierJournal.com, Glenn Jackson, 39, faces charges of murder and tampering with physical evidence. Jackson told police that he last saw his wife on October 20th, 2019, a few days before she was reported missing. Jackson has worked as an honors instructor at Eastern Kentucky University, but a university spokeswoman told the Lexington Herald Leader that he has not been employed at the school since February. I wonder what that's about. I wonder if there was some type of, were they starting to catch wind of the investigation or the allegations around the physical abuse? Or was he starting to act in a different way and that caused some issues for him at work? Kind of curious to know um, what's going on there. And I'm sure if there is some aspect that um, touches this, it's going to come out probably in the court proceedings. Information on upcoming court dates or whether he has an attorney was not immediately available. So on Facebook, Jason, her former husband, has now posted some information. Um, I feel like, I don't know why, but over this past year, I just feel like I'm really trying to ring the bell about domestic violence and make sure people understand what this is like. And Jason, um, he's an extremely good writer. As I was looking through what he's written here, I was kind of thinking, oh, I should edit this and just kind of trim it up for, for time. I can't. Uh, every word in this is important, and I really want to share this with you guys. So, But before, uh, on the post, he's saying, I wrote the following a week after Ella's October 20th disappearance, but was unable to post it then due to her husband not knowing that he was a suspect. In fact, the only suspect in her disappearance and presumed murder. So it's interesting in this case, um, we now find out there was a suspect. They never named him publicly. So, and even looking at this case at how we now have an arrest, we still don't have a body, but we have an arrest. It's clear that they had enough information that they really didn't need to push through media to try to get any other pieces. And think about these situations. These domestic violence, violence situations are taking place in homes. So, you know, the chances of there being some type of witness or someone that has information that could help contribute to that, it's not as available as if this was someone that, you know, disappeared when they were walking back from a bar or, or something along those lines. This is a whole different situation. Um, but let's read through the piece that he originally wrote and get a little sense of, a much deeper sense actually, of what's going on. An agonizing week of uncertainty following Ella's disappearance has given way to despair and devastating heartbreak. Sorry, I ran short on time to meet up today is inconsequential unless it's the last opportunity to do so in this lifetime. Talk to you tomorrow seems mundane until tomorrow never comes. These will forever be the last words she wrote to me. Ella came into my life in 2003, the year after I had become widowed by murder. She presented herself as widowed too, but her story imprinted a different type of trauma than mine. Her consent for that marriage was given under duress in a different cultural context. Her husband was abusive, and she eventually found an opportunity to flee to Ukraine, where she had close relatives, to escape this reign of terror. However, any solace she gained from the physical distance was fleeting, because she soon realized it provided little respite from the persistent fear that he would find her. Running neither fast nor far had allowed her to escape the psychological terror and trauma that he enacted upon her. Ultimately, she considered herself widowed because she didn't feel free and safe from him until he died while imprisoned for beating another man to death. 
even as the emotional scars of our respective and all too recent histories continued to haunt us, Ella and I quickly developed a deep appreciation and love for one another. Although neither of us necessarily needed to be rescued, it's difficult to characterize our experience together as anything less than a mutual rescue. In a cruel twist of fate, however, the wounds that helped draw us together had lingering scabs that couldn't withstand the torque placed on two lives that had been so forcefully shaken off the rails by abuse and murder. After some years of struggling to figure it out together, we cried the day we agreed to divorce. Not so much out of sadness that our marriage was ending as out of an overwhelming sense of hope that doing so was our first step toward rediscovering the treasured and loving friendship we had once shared. Our hope was realized and we remained among one another's most cherished people in life, even as we moved along with our independent lives. However, Ella's darkest days were not in the rearview mirror when she fled Russia and an abusive husband. The betrayal that felled her in the worst way this past Sunday lurked within her own home in recent years and felt hauntingly familiar to her. She had an uneasy feeling about it early on. She retained my last name even after marriage, until the birth of their son, because, as she put it, she knew I was forever, but she couldn't say the same about her new husband. Nonetheless, hope triumphed over experience, and she persisted in the marriage. The chains of marriage grew stronger with the birth of their son, even as the chokehold became more unbearable. Initially, the renewed sense of meaning her new child provided left her beaming like I had rarely seen her before. However, starting a year or so later, in the summer of 2015, she began conveying to me that she feared for her safety. The messages and rushed phone calls were all too regular in recent years. I need your help. I am very scared. I am scared to the point of not being okay to get out of the bedroom to get a cup of milk or change my tampon. I'm being awakened at almost three in the morning and dragged through the house. It's getting seriously scary and I am very worried about my child and myself. To ensure that she would not stay in an unsafe situation due to financial dependence, I offered to provide all the financial and material support she needed if she left. But as is often the case with women in these situations, she packed a bag to leave on multiple occasions, then hesitated because Maybe she was overreacting. Maybe it was the alcohol and not him. Maybe she had done something wrong herself to provoke him. Self-doubt aside, Ella's most debilitating fear of leaving was that she had reason to believe her husband would take her child from her if she left. Ella loved her boy more than life itself, so she refused to risk it until a fail-safe exit plan was in place. After years stuck in a cycle of violence, Ella had recently begun working in earnest with a lawyer on an exit plan. She met with her lawyer three days prior to her disappearance. So begins the most dangerous time for women leaving an abusive relationship. Although Ella was very private and cautious about her communication on sensitive issues, for example, I am deleting this conversation and please do not write anything back in regard to this subject unless I start writing about it first, she expressed greater confidence about the privacy of her conversations in recent months. For example, she informed me that uh, about her secret meeting with her lawyer in writing through Facebook Messenger, but did not delete that conversation. That confidence was misplaced. Perhaps the single most horrifying moment among many, two days after her disappearance and five days after secretly meeting with her lawyer, was the discovery that her husband knew how to get into her phone. Among other falsehoods, her husband has told police concerning her disappearance. He says nothing happened, that he didn't see her leave, but that she left voluntarily. She could just as well have been abducted against her will, which makes more sense given that her five-year-old child, whom she had never spent a night away from, phone and car were still at the house, and she hasn't been seen or heard from since. But tellingly, her husband exhibits neither concern nor curiosity for where she might be. Truth is, getting people to believe the unbelievable is really his only hope for making all this go away, and isn't an entirely surprising strategy. In Ella's own prophetic words, if 
something happens to me that might look like an accident, don't believe it. Ella has long been one among few people who I cherish most in this life, one for whom I would literally give everything to support and my life to protect. Although legal documents indicate that our marriage ended more than a decade ago, our love and appreciation for one another never wavered and our hearts have been connected forevermore. Even as the details of what happened remain unclear, a sober reading of the known facts torments my soul to the core. I wail and scream in desperation like I've done once before because the whispers in my head tell me I've been widowed by murder once more with Ella Dybolt Jackson. I am extremely moved um, by his words. I'm so thankful that he was able to share that, that now is the time to get that out. Um, and from what I understand, the child, uh, I believe he's now six years old, is being taken care of by Jason, um, which might be the only thing that kind of makes sense in this whole event of just things that don't make sense. So where do we go from here with this case? We have the arrest. Um, we might have enough physical evidence in terms of the blood, but there's still a big question, where is Ella? And there's still another question of, do you have information that can help the authorities with this case? So in the description box below, you will find contact information for them as well. I wanna see both of these prosecutions go well. And if you're someone that can help with that, please use that contact information and send it in. Thank you guys so much for spending time with me on this episode. I know this is a tough subject, um, but I'm just realizing the more I look into it and the more I look into cases, um, this subject is coming up time and time again, and I want to do something to help. I, I don't know what we can do. Um, I want to raise exposure to, uh, to it. I want to try to make tools for people to learn more about it. Um, and I think telling these stories is very important. And that's why I didn't even want to touch one word from what Jason had, had put so eloquently uh, and emotionally about this. I would like to thank new patron Marie. And a big thank you to Christina and Maria for increasing their pledges. And on behalf of everyone that is one of my patrons or people that donate through PayPal as well, we're going to make a donation to the Domestic Violence Hotline again today um, for this episode so they can continue doing their work to help people that are facing terrible situations like this. Thank you so much, everyone. Have a wonderful weekend. If you are not busy tomorrow night, we are doing another true crime game time. So if you'd like to spend some time with me live, help raise some money for Feeding America, please join us there. That will be at 6 p.m. Uh, Pacific Mountain Time, 8 p.m. Central, 9 p.m. Eastern. I hope to see a bunch of you guys there. Take care, and I'll see you back here on Monday with a brand new episode of Case Cracked on the Lord and Arts channel.